Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome an eminent author and activist from Toronto, Canada, Dr. Nora Gold. Nora, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gold is a writer, publisher, and editor of a literary journal, JewishFiction.net. She is an author of three best-selling books, Marrow and Other Stories, Fields of Exile, and The Dead Man. She's the winner of two Canadian Jewish Book and Literary Awards. She's a former professor of social work, and she's a community activist involved in feminist issues and interfaith dialogue between Jews and Muslims. My goodness, you seem to be having a you know an absolutely full day every day <laughs> i feel very lucky to absolutely. be able to do so many things like absolutely this. so before we start talking about jewish fiction tell me a little bit about your journey my journey well i began i've always had kind of two prongs to my life i always wrote mm -hmm. and i always was very concerned about the world okay so when it came to choosing what to, what I would study mm -hmm. and what direction I would head in career-wise, mm -hmm. I was advised to enter social work. Mm -hmm. I was already doing volunteer work, and I just loved it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is the place for me. But I also continued writing. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was, since I took my work very seriously, and first I took my work seriously as a social worker, and then once I got a doctorate, I took my work seriously as a professor, mm -hmm. um, I had less and less time to write. And so what happened was that uh, I would just happen to wake up at one in the morning, every mm -hmm. morning, mm -hmm. and write until five, and okay. go back to sleep till seven, mm -hmm. and then work a full day and be with my family. And at a certain point, I just said, this is ridiculous. I have to make a choice. So, so I made uh, the choice to leave an academic career. And so I could write fiction full time. Fantastic. So for the past 22 years, that's been my, my place. How wonderful. Maybe I'm going to learn something from you. Because when I'm in, in my in my writing phase, I sometimes wake up at two in the morning, and work till five o'clock and I've written say 3000 words. Wow. That's, that's another, uh, another time. For you. But yeah. so nice let's to talk to another writer who okay. understands. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so Nora, let's talk about jewishfiction.net. Yes. Tell me a little bit about this venture and why did you start this? Mm -hmm. Well, jewishfiction.net is an online literary journal. Mm -hmm. It's the only literary journal in the world, either print or online that's devoted exclusively to publishing Jewish fiction. Okay. And we publish Jewish fiction from all around the world. And anyone can read and enjoy the stories the same way I would like to read Indian, Italian, Cuban stories. This, mm -hmm. this journal's not only for Jewish readers, it's for anybody who loves to read. Mm -hmm. And we're honored to have published fiction by some of the most eminent Jewish writers like mm -hmm. Elie Wiesel, Aaron Appelfeld, and, and so forth. But we also uh, care very much about publishing beginning authors who are talented. Mm -hmm. So we publish works that are either written in English or translated into English from 18 languages. Oh. And uh, in our first 11 years, we've published over 500 works that were never before published in English. Amazing. And last week, we put out our 31st issue. And we have readers in 140 countries. So uh, our URL is www.jewishfiction.net. Www mm -hmm. It's free of charge and very easy to sign up to. Absolutely. And so all, my, are, all my viewers and listeners do check out www.jewishfiction.net. Thank you. Um, I had a few motivations. You asked a good question about what got me to start this journal. Mm -hmm. And what happened was I knew some writers who were writing great fiction and couldn't find a publisher for their work. And 
it probably sounds funny now because we've lived in the digital world for so long. Mm. But when it first began, it caused a real seismic shock to the mm. publishing world and publishers were not willing to take a risk on new writers. Mm. And I got worried about all this great literature getting lost. Um, there was no journal, either print or online, that focused specifically on Jewish fiction. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to read Jewish fiction, all you could find really was English language stuff for the most part. If you were an English language reader, um, it was almost just American. There was very little, even from Canada, England or Australia. But significantly for me, there was almost no Jewish fiction available that was translated from other languages mm -hmm. into English. So mm -hmm. accessible through translation to English mm -hmm. readers. And mm -hmm. I wanted to read Jewish fiction being written in South America and Greece and Turkey mm -hmm. and all around the world, mm -hmm. including India. And actually, speaking of India, a wonderful thing happened. Mm -hmm. Last year in India, the first Jewish book in 50 years came out. Wow. Uh, it was written in Hindi. It's mm -hmm. been translated into English, but not yet published in English. Mm -hmm. um, it's called, well, forgive my accent, uh, Miss Samuel Ek Yehudi Gata. Mm -hmm. And this is a sort of thing that really excites me. So in terms of how JewishFiction.net started, I thought mm -hmm. there really needs to be a journal mm -hmm. of Jewish fiction that's truly international. Mm -hmm. um, I also had a couple of other motivations, mm -hmm. actually. Um, the Jewish community over the past couple of decades, and I think this is there are parallels to every community, mm -hmm. uh, it was becoming increasingly polarized in, between left and right, religious, mm -hmm. secular, and all sorts of divisions. And I thought there should be a place where all kinds of Jews and their stories could meet each other and find a common space where they could have exchanges in a civil and safe space. So actually, JewishFiction.net is a place for everyone. We've published authors who are left and right wing, who hold different religious attitudes, who have different sexual orientations and diverse cultural backgrounds, including Ashkenazi Jews from European countries and Mizrahi Jews from Middle Eastern ones. So that was my agenda for the Jewish community. But I also wanted to use stories to create a bridge between Jewish and non-Jewish readers. So for me, JewishFiction.net was created as an act of cultural and interfaith exchange. Um, I wanted non-Jews to be able to read Jewish literature. And in fact, they do. And not all the authors we publish in JewishFiction.net are even Jewish. We've published some excellent stories by non-Jewish authors, for example, about the Holocaust or intermarriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, in terms of being a place that's accessible to everybody, mm -hmm. I designed this journal to be free of charge so mm -hmm. that income would not be a barrier for anyone. And so we're sustained entirely by donations from our readers. Mm -hmm. And all of us who work on this journal are volunteers. This is uh, a labor of love for everyone, including me. And do you have a copy at hand which you can show to our readers? Or it's online? Uh, it's it's online. It's okay. online. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how have you, uh, and I'm sure you've got data, how has JewishFiction.net impacted your readers? Well, it, it has had a significant impact in various ways. First of all, as many um, people who've written about JewishFiction.net, because we've had a lot of publicity, many people have called it a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, JewishFiction.net has brought Jewish fiction into people's lives in a very easy, accessible way. Mm. Um, a new issue just appears on your phone or computer screen three mm -hmm. times a year. So it's really helped to disseminate internationally. Mm -hmm. For example, at this point, 30% of the works we publish are translated into English from other languages. So okay. we're now known and recognized in the international translation field. Mm -hmm. And this is very rewarding. I recently met a publisher who specializes in translated works. And mm -hmm. I introduced myself. I started to tell her about JewishFiction.net. And she said, no, I read your issue every time it comes out. You know, it's... Yeah. Um, the other thing about it, though, the other impact that we have... Um, mm -hmm which I think is very significant, is not only on readers, but on writers. 
um, as I said earlier, you know, part of the impetus for starting this journal was finding a place for first rate Jewish mm-hmm. fiction. Mm-hmm. And there are very few places other than us. Uh, there's no other journal like us, but even journals or magazines that will publish one story a year or something like that. There's almost no place to publish. So we've provided an opening for many authors, a place to publish their work. In some cases, their first work. Yeah, I could say we've helped to launch the start of a number of writing careers. Actually. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. And this is an amazing service that you're doing to a big community of writers. Uh, Nora, moving on, you're also a community activist. Um, and I was fascinated to see that you are actually talking about interfaith dialogue between Jews and Muslims. I was day before yesterday in Dubai. Oh. And uh, for the first time, I actually noticed on my hotel floor, a couple of rabbis. And I said, the world has changed completely. <laughs> Thank God for that. Absolutely. But yes. you, I wanted to know from you, what are some of the issues you address and some of the challenges you face? Well, this was, it's a wonderful question. And I I love doing this kind of work. It's part of feminist activism that I've done because Mm -hmm. the the work I did was with other feminists. Mm -hmm. Um, I had done feminist work in the field of workplace health, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, activism in that area Mm -hmm. and working with caregivers, uh, mothers of children with disabilities Mm -hmm. who um, were in many ways uh, victims of sexism Mm -hmm. inadvertently. That's another topic. Mm -hmm. Um, But I cared very much about, as as you could hear from the way I talk about Mm -hmm. jewishfiction.net, building bridges uh, across cultures and, and faith groups. And, uh, I'd served on various committees and task forces, people, boards, people knew this. And I'd also been um, an expert community resource to the Ontario Hate Crimes Commission. And, and then I, at one point, co-founded an educational organization that was promoting tolerance and mutual understanding between Jews and Arabs. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I got into... Uh, uh, discussing religion and religious background and faith mm-hmm. with with those people. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in several dialogue groups with Jews and Muslims, but the one that that uh, you're touching on was a feminist group. And uh, I suppose the main challenge in that group, and I guess perhaps this is inevitable given the world we live in. Correct. Uh, we were a group of Canadian women, half Muslims, half Jews, mm-hmm. and we had very divergent perspectives on Israel. Correct. And obviously, I'm not going to, this isn't a political conversation. Mm-hmm. We saw things very differently. And of course, that was to be expected. Mm-hmm. Um, I had already been in a dialogue group for three years, uh, a, a long standing one with both mm-hmm. women and men. And we had in any good dialogue group, you're extremely candid with each other. So I knew exactly uh, what to expect in this new one. And I wasn't surprised that we we had very different opinions. I, I would have been very shocked if we didn't. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a fiction writer, as a person, but also as a fiction writer, I know there's no one truth for everyone. There are always different and and very often conflicting narratives about any topic, mm-hmm. uh, including politics, maybe especially politics. Mm-hmm. But in spite of this area of difference, there was such a great bond between all of us in the group. We had a great deal in common as women, as feminists. And as the group developed, we went from discussing feminist issues and religion, and we talked about very personal matters, including marriage and motherhood, our marriages. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was very touched when when some of the women in the group began to talk about the problems within their own community, mm-hmm. the extremism there and the extremism in the Jewish community mm-hmm. and the parallels between the two. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we held our meetings not in a, you know, a formal place. We met every time in someone's home. So we got to know their families. We ate their food, uh, got to learn the foods and everything else. And and one time I attended a woman's 
um, her brother had died and I attended the funeral in her mosque. Mm -hmm. And by a coincidence, a happy coincidence, my synagogue had a program going on. We're paired up with a mosque in our city. Mm -hmm. And some of the women in my dialogue group happened to be at that. This was their mosque. So there was a lot of learning uh, Challenge the challenges, of course, but it was a wonderful experience and I think very fruitful and productive for all of us. Fascinating. And you do see light at the end of the tunnel, I'm sure. I do. I, I feel optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that in a naive way. Mm -hmm. I, I really know how hard the path is, mm -hmm. but I also believe that we can move forward. I Absolutely. Agree. I agree. And what I saw in Dubai, I, I thought uh, was a game changer. I've been going to Dubai since the early 90s. Yeah. And I have never seen this before. And wow. I've been a YPO member and I was talking to some friends and they actually told me that we are taking an aircraft full of Jewish YPO members to Dubai. Wow. <laughs> so, so therefore, I, I have a lot of hope the world is changing. But uh, Nora, now moving on to your books. Thank You've you. written three books. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about each of the books. Certainly. Uh, my first book, Marrow and Other Stories, dealt with different issues in each story. So it was, each one was quite unique. Um, these included a story about political violence that resulted in a miscarriage for a woman, mm -hmm. sexual abuse by a trusted community leader, mm -hmm. um, that book was written a long time ago, but it couldn't be more relevant to today, yep. unfortunately. Uh, the anorexia of a girl's cousin and what the girl could or couldn't do to save this cousin that she loved. Discovering the infidelity of someone that the character really had admired. Um, there was a story about forgiveness, forgiving mm -hmm. others and oneself. And there was also a feminist retelling of the Joseph story in the Bible, where Joseph became a woman named Yosefa. Right. Um, my second book, which was my first novel, was Fields of Exile. And this was about freedom of speech on college campuses. In a way, right. it was a po political book. Um, mm -hmm specifically on the topics of Israel and anti-Semitism, anti what you can say, what you can't say. And the main character in this novel pays a very high price for standing up for what she believes. Mm -hmm. But in the process, she learns a lot about herself and mm -hmm. she finds courage that she didn't know she had. Mm -hmm. My third book, um, the novel, The Dead Man, is about an obsessed woman, mm -hmm. a composer of classical Jewish music, who is trying to recover from a love relationship in the past. Um, I'd say in all my books, the characters have struggles, mm -hmm. but there's meaning to their struggles. And they do the best they can with the challenges in their lives, I would say, like most of us. Okay. Um, and the books are also full of humor. They, they have serious topics, as you heard, but they're full of humor and joie de vivre and all the pleasures of daily life. Mm. Um, I also have a fourth book coming out in oh, wow. 2024, okay. which will be two novellas. Thank you. Um, the first novella is called In Sickness and in Health. Again, mm -hmm. this was written before COVID, but it's very mm -hmm. relevant. It's about a woman with an invisible disability, which she hides even yeah. from her husband. And the other novella is about six people in a prayer service who mm -hmm. are all very isolated and lost people, mm -hmm. but they're brought together in a crisis that changes mm -hmm. all of their lives. And I just finished a new novella this month. <laughs> wow. um, and I'm looking for a publisher or an agent. So if anybody out there has any ideas, they're very welcome. Fantastic. And uh, all my books are available on Amazon. Mm. And a few of my stories are also available to be read on my website at noragold.com. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. So my question to you, and I, you know, I have two fiction books, and I've often been asked, what is the basis on which you develop your characters? Ooh. And my response to them was that every author uses some life uh, you know, relationships and networks, which is how characters are developed. I'd love to get your perspective on how have you developed your characters. Oh, that's such a great question. And we have to talk after we turn off the, yeah, we the camera. We have to talk, yeah. Um, 
Well, you know, before I wrote fiction, or as I wrote fiction, I was also writing nonfiction for my academic life. So I was comparing the two things in my mind. Mm -hmm. And for me, nonfiction was mainly an intellectual process. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you decide what you're going to study and you do your lit review and so forth and you write it up. What I find is that fiction places demands on me that are that are definitely intellectual, but they're mm -hmm. also emotional and spiritual. Um, and I definitely draw on my life. I think this is because of the emotional nature of this mm -hmm. kind of writing. It's the most demanding work I've ever done. Right. But at the same time, the most exciting. And I, it's definitely when I feel most alive. Mm -hmm. um, I think writing is a slow process because, at least in part, because at least the way I write, and I'm interested to hear about you, Ash, but in my case, it involves very much an unconscious process. Correct. So, yeah, I'm not surprised you agree. Um, the, the editing process is, of course, very conscious and intellectual, but the core of writing fiction is your human experience and everything you've felt and seen and wondered about and hoped for. And when you're really writing, it just flows out of you. And you don't, or I don't anyway, really even know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I'll write something and then after a couple of hours, I'll go back and read it and say, oh, so I guess that's what I'm thinking about these days, you mm -hmm. know, with, with real fiction writing. And I mean, there are people who consider themselves fiction writers and there are many ways to write fiction. I'm certainly not saying my way is the mm -hmm. only way, but there are people who do it in a very... I actually met someone who said, I'm going to pick this kind of character and put her, you know, in a very sort of self-conscious way, mm -hmm. which is also can result in wonderful writing. But the way I write, um, you, you don't really know until you see it in front of you on the paper, what you're writing, you know, you have some idea, like I'm going to set this in a Canyon in 1968 and there'll be two girls, but um, and, or maybe it'll deal with the loss of, of a sister or something, but but the rest is up for grabs until it's written. And I think that's partly why it takes a long time to write a novel or novella or even a very good story, because you can't just make it happen like turning on a tap. Absolutely. You know, with like with academic writing, I was able to say, OK, I'm going to turn out X number of pages a day. Mm. I'm just going to get it done. Mm. But with fiction, your story has to simmer inside you, you know, like a good soup until it's fully cooked yep. and all the extraneous elements have boiled away. Mm. That's how I think of it. No, no, that's a fantastic response. Thank you. <laughs> and my last question to you, and this is for the many, many people who will listen to our conversation. Thank you. Based on your amazing experience as an author, as an activist, what would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away from your own journey and from our conversation? <laughs> Great questions. You ask the best questions. Thank you. The first one won't surprise you. Mm -hmm. It's that you have to read. Mm -hmm. And by read, by reading, I don't mean uh, reading text messages yeah. and reading social media, much as I love social media mm -hmm. and all the other things one reads. I'm reading now a wonderful book by... Marianne Wolf mm -hmm. called Come Home, mm -hmm. Come Home, Comma, Reader. Mm -hmm. And it's about how the digital world has made it very difficult for us to read. Even neurologically, mm -hmm. we have adapted to the digital world. And there's very great concern about mm -hmm. even she started to lose her ability to do real reading, what I call real reading, deep reading. Um, so, so the first thing I would like to say is mm -hmm. read good fiction, even if yeah. it's just for 15 minutes a day at first, you know, yeah. and then work your way up to 20 minutes, up to an hour. It will absolutely transform your life. Okay. It will enrich it and bring you joy in ways you can barely imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't know what book, you know, it's not hard to find out books. You can read any books you yeah. find that are recommended uh you can read my books you can read jewish fiction but just read 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 mm -hmm. the second one i would say is and maybe this uh, seems obvious but do what you feel you are meant to do mm -hmm. and then in brackets i'd say 
you know, insofar as your life circumstances yeah. allow. I mean, if you're a sole parent with 12 children to support, you can't necessarily do exactly yeah. what you wish you could do. Right. But insofar as you can, really, you you must do what gives you joy and makes mm-hmm. you feel alive, you know. Mm-hmm. I could still be a professor Mm -hmm. um, and I enjoyed being a professor, but I've spent the last 22 years writing, which is what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I would say is to try and do something, not just for yourself, but for the world Yeah, and try and leave it at least a little better than you found it because you know, this we have a beautiful world, but it needs a lot of help. <laughs> and we all have to do what we can. Wonderful, you know, and, and on that note, Nora, uh, and your three wonderful lessons, you must read uh, good fiction. And you very rightly said, you know, look at, look at either Nora's book, Jewish fiction, or anything else that is recommended. Second is do what you feel you are meant to do within your own set of constraints. And the third one you said was do something for the world and leave it a better place. Thank you so much for speaking to me about JewishFiction.net, about your work as an activist and about all three of your books. And good luck for your forthcoming book and books. Thank Thank you you so much. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.